All right, everybody, welcome back. So today, expansion and crisis for Rome. We're getting to the stuff that I really enjoyed today, the warfare. And I'm going to tell you about my favorite set of wars. It's like one of the biggest things that establishes Rome as a power in the Mediterranean world. All right. So the Roman legions, this is what they called their army. All right. Uh, Rome's success in war was because of their strong army. And they also, and how they broke it down into small, fast moving fighting units. Okay. Uh, each soldier was well trained. They're called legionnaires. And they are going to be how Rome is going to conquer one of the largest land empires ever to exist. Now, they would treat the people that they conquer actually pretty decent compared to a lot of other empires that would have risen and fallen or will rise and fall on you know either side of Rome existing, okay? So the big one that we're going to talk about is the Punic Wars. This is 118 years worth of conflict broken into three different events. All right, so let's get into it. This is the stuff I really like, guys. So Rome against Carthage. Looking at that map, you know, Rome is here in Italy. Carthage is here, modern-day Tunisia, North, uh, North Africa and coast. If Carthage should sound very familiar because when we were talking about the Phoenicians, you know, some time ago, I mentioned that one of these cities that they founded in their, you know, exploration of the Mediterranean and trade and all that was Carthage. And I told you it'd be very, very important to Roman history when we got to it. And now we're here to take a look. So Rome, they're going to conquer most of Carthage's colonies in Sicily because the first Punic War is about fighting for control of Sicily. And what we're going to see is that sea power is going to be like the big deal about it. All right. And I mentioned sea power for this reason. Carthage had, at starting out with the first Punic War, they had the best navy. Okay. And Rome, they were lagging behind very, very much. But that kind of starts to change when they find a, you know, a crashed, uh, one or two Carthaginian ships and they reverse engineer it. They take it apart to find out how it's put together. And then they start building their own ships. And then they start being able to go toe to toe with the Carthaginian Navy. So this is going to lead to, you know, Carthage surrendering after a, a number of losses militarily. And, you know, Rome is going to take control of Sicily. They're going to take control of a couple other islands that were Carthages, like um, Corsica and Sardinia. They're like the two big islands that are to the left of Italy when you're looking at the map. Now, the Carthaginian general who was in charge of like trying to fight the Romans on the island of Sicily, uh, his name was, has, was um, Hamilcar, if I remember correctly. Um, his son is going to be the top general for the Second Punic War, which is, you know, you know, a good 20 years after the Punic, First Punic War ends, the second one begins. And his son is Hannibal. Now, this is the guy, he, the, this family, the Barkas, they're going to basically get be fed up with what's going on in the city of Carthage. They're going to relocate to some Carthaginian colonies in Spain, and they're going to conquer a lot of Spain for Carthage. Now, Hannibal, he's going to build up an army in Spain for Carthage, and he is going to, when he's given the order, he's going to invade Italy. He's going to march from Spain through southern France, and he's the one who crosses the Alps. He's the general with the elephants crossing the Alps, all right? Now, he's going to defeat 
many, many Roman armies. He's going to slaughter armies that are bigger than his. The biggest defeat comes at the Battle of Cannae, where his like 40, 42,000 men are going to annihilate an army of between 70 and 80,000 Romans. Very, very few of the Romans escape. Like so many Romans are killed in this battle that when their like gold rings and uh, bracelets and armbands are taken to Carthage, there are so many of them that they cover the floor of the Carthaginian Senate Hall. That is a buttload of bracelets. All right, guys. That's how many men Hannibal was like capable of having killed on a battlefield because he was a brilliant, brilliant general. Personally, my favorite from history. So, yeah. Now, he is eventually going to be defeated because if there's one thing Rome is good at, they're good at adapting, evolving their tactics so that they can overcome adversity. So that's what they do with Hannibal. They're able to defeat him and they're able to, you know, defeat Carthage. They beat them a second time. Now, after this second Punic War is done, and we're going to see a video about the Punic Wars on the next slide, uh, we're going to fast forward a no, like a good 50 years or so. And Rome, they're fearing that Carthage might try and rise again. So they are going to preemptively attack. So they're going to attack first before they can be attacked by Carthage. And they're going to burn the city to the ground. They're going to enslave the population. And they're going to salt the earth so nothing will ever rise there again. You know, so they basically wiped Carthage off the face of the earth because they feared them so much. But as a result, Rome is now the top power in the Mediterranean world. All right, so real quick, let's watch this video and then we will move on, finishing up the expansion and crisis period for Rome. The Three Punic Wars make up possibly one of the most intense chapters in Roman history, so if you want the full story, please check out this video on the Roman Republic. The short of it is that over the centuries, the tiny town of Rome grew and grew until it conquered the entire Italian peninsula. Basically, they leveled up, and Carthage was the next level. The first war can be roughly attributed to a miscommunication with some Sicilian pirates. While Carthage and Rome may have been destined to fight each other at some point or another, they ultimately came to blows on account of both being called into Sicily to settle a fight between the city of Syracuse and some rowdy pirates. Rome and Carthage kind of just tripped face first into war, and spent most of the 23 year long war not actually fighting each other. The issue was Carthage had been a long standing naval power in the Mediterranean, but Rome had no navy to speak of. So Rome really needed a navy, and quick. This is another of many instances of Rome adapting to situations really well. Say what you will about Rome, they were immensely clever and had a great habit of taking good ideas, methods, technologies, and techniques from other cultures and using them to great effect. In this case, the Romans found a few beached and sunk Carthaginian triremes and quinquiremes and proceeded to reverse engineer an entire fleet of ships. You know, just casually, as you do. Rome's first aquatic outings weren't all that fruitful, but at battles like Cape Ignomus, which is arguably one of the biggest naval battles in history, Rome pulled out wins. Ultimately, Rome won the war, claiming Sicily for itself and forcing heavy reparations on Carthage. They also decided to take Corsica and Sardinia because, screw you Carthage, these are mine now. In the decades following, the Carthaginians, led by the general Hamilcar Barca, colonized the seaside coast of Spain, largely for the purposes of mining silver to pay their Roman reparations. Little did Rome know, Hamilcar, his son Hannibal, and the other Carthaginians in Spain were furious over losing Sicily course against Sardinia, and had been casually scheming to completely destroy Rome for almost two whole decades. In 219 BC, Hannibal sacked the Roman allied Saguntum in Spain, and Rome, defensively of course, declared war. Hannibal, the madman, proceeded to rather famously Leroy Jenkins his way across the goddamn Alps with over 40,000 soldiers and 37 elephants. ELEPHANTS! 
And while elephants aren't particularly scary to us, if you're an ancient Roman who's never seen an elephant before, that thing is a four-legged giant with two spears and a snake coming out of its face. Bottom line, they're monsters. The Romans thought they were monsters. Granted, most of Hannibal's elephants died while crossing the Alps, perhaps unsurprisingly, but it doesn't take a lot of elephants to have a scary amount of elephant on the battlefield. I genuinely can't convey how viscerally terrifying the mere mention of Hannibal's name would have been to a Roman. Now, to change the topic away from the Carthaginian boogeyman, since we're talking about Roman military history here, I'll refer you to my video on classical warfare for some context. It mostly talks about hoplite warfare, but I cover the classic Roman Republican army in the later portion. Although, as it turns out, the Roman army that conquered the Italian peninsula was basically a hoplite army, so honestly the whole video is probably relevant to Roman history. Anyway, after arriving in Italy, Hannibal demonstrated his tactical brilliance by immediately winning two battles in northern Italy through guerrilla and ambush tactics. Hannibal and his armies would proceed to stay in Italy, effectively behind enemy lines with next to no means of supply or reinforcement, for 16 years. The Carthaginians went up and down the peninsula, setting fire to farms left and right, hoping above all else for Rome to simply surrender. Two years into the campaign, Hannibal said, alright, screw this, I'm gonna destroy the entire Roman army, and proceeded to make plans for his next battle, at the Roman supply depot at Cannae in southern Italy. At the battle, the Carthaginians advanced in a U-shape, with 40,000 infantry forming the front line and 10,000 cavalry on the wings. The Romans, however, had almost twice as big an army, so they felt pretty good about their chances. The armies met, and as the fighting progressed, the center of the Carthaginian line fell back, and the Romans pushed forward, hoping to break the retreating line. Except, at that moment when they all rushed in, the Carthaginians' African infantry and famed Numidian cavalry advanced on the flanks and effectively enveloped the whole Roman army. From there, it was a bloodbath. Estimates are all over the place, but the gist is that most of the 80,000 strong Roman army was killed outright and the rest were imprisoned. The slaughter went on until nightfall and, in one version of the story I've heard, the Carthaginians only started taking prisoners because their arms got tired from all the killing. It was the single greatest defeat that Rome ever suffered in its history. And Hannibal hoped that a shattered and dismayed Rome, having lost 16 legions in the entire south of Italy, would surrender at once. Rome's response was simply, see you next year. And it spent the entire winter raising more armies to go out the following summer. For the next several years, the Roman army pursued the strategy of just bother him and shadowed Hannibal around the Italian countryside. He was still being annoying, but he wasn't a direct threat to the city of Rome, so good enough for now. But jumping back, can we take a second to appreciate the sheer quintessential Roman badassery it takes to hear that you lost at least 50,000 soldiers and then turn around and tell the guy who killed them to shove it and wait for round two? Because holy crap, that takes some serious coleones. Serious and massively suicidal coleones. And speaking of, in 211, the young Publius Cornelius Scipio took up a generalship for the Spanish campaign, which was widely considered to be a suicide mission. To the surprise of basically everyone, he spent the next five years successfully decarthagifying Spain to great effect. Following his campaign, he hatched a brilliant plan to take the fight back to Carthage. The Senate, thinking this was another suicide mission, told him he could do it, but they wouldn't finance his armies. So Scipio raised a couple legions in Italy and Sicily and hopped over to North Africa. Now, while Hannibal is absolutely a brilliant general in that he did impossibly crazy stuff like crossing the Alps, campaigning in Italy for 16 years, and wiping out an entire Roman army, Scipio's brilliance came from his quintessentially Roman ability to adopt and adapt. The Romans, above all else, knew a good idea when they saw one, and they almost never made the same mistake twice. Scipio studied Cannae, and he knew what he had to do to defeat Carthage. Since the Numidian cavalry was critical to the Carthaginian army, Scipio played into a Numidian civil war to get some of their cavalry for himself. In doing so, he had massively weakened Carthage on their own soil, and had nearly orchestrated their surrender when, oh snap, Hannibal's back! And on that day, history nerds from all around the world and across time busted out the popcorn because this is gonna be good. The night before the impending Battle of Zama, Hannibal and Scipio actually, supposedly, had a meeting. It's detailed in Livy's History of Rome, Book 30, Chapters 30 and 31. There's a link in the description, it takes five minutes, just read it, okay? For me. Read it, it's incredible. 
First, they're simply in awe of each other. Then, Hannibal waxes philosophical about fortune, gives Scipio life advice, and asks for peace. Scipio responded, Well, I was going to make peace, but then you brought an army here. I can't just leave now. Look, Hannibal, I respect you. I really do. And you're leaving me no choice here, man. I've just got to kick your ass, dude. I'm sorry. There's no other way. I have to kick your ass. And on the following day, some asses were certainly kicked. At the Battle of Zama, Scipio's Numidian cavalry put the Carthaginian cavalry to flight, and fighting between the infantry lines was actually very close until the Roman cavalry returned from behind the Carthaginian line to ultimately win the day. It was a hard-fought and super tense battle, but with that, the Second Punic War was won. Half a century and a lot of Cato the Elder ending all of his speeches with Carthago de Lenda est later, Rome returns to raise Carthage to the ground. To rub more salt in the wound, the Romans also literally rubbed salt in the earth to make sure the Carthaginians would never rise again. Wow. Okay, so there's regular bitter, there's Taylor Swift writes a song about you bitter, and then there's Rome hates you so much they wipe you off the face of the earth forever bitter. Moral of the story is Rome does not screw around, so don't screw with Rome. And that's the Punic Wars. If you'd like to see where the rest of the story goes, give this video a click in the description and hop on back to the Roman Republic. And remember, Carthago de Lenda Est. All right. Hope that you enjoyed that. I know I certainly did because I, I love the Punic Wars. But okay, so the Republic in crisis. We're going to see after time goes by that the Romans are facing a growing social discontent in this like new and growing empire. Um, by around 100 BC, about 30% of the people living in Rome were slaves. That's a huge population, right? So slave labor is going to replace paid labor. So people are going to start just relying on slaves for more and more things. Thousands of rural people who were like the paid workers on the fields that are now being replaced by slaves are going to start pouring into the cities that are under Roman control, looking for jobs. So to try and deal with the growing unrest in the cities, we're going to see, you know, Roman stationed, Rome's it's going to station armies and legions in most of the provinces. They're going to start having armies in all of their territory. And the army leaders, they're going to start coming to power in Rome. They're going to have privately paid, you know, soldiers. They're going to employ these urban poor people to serve in their armies and meaning for the first time in Rome's history, soldiers are going to have allegiance to the commanders and not to the Republic, not to the city, not to the government, because these private leaders are giving them jobs. So that is going to pose an interesting problem for Rome in the future. And perhaps the most famous of these leaders is Julius Caesar. Now, he was a brilliant guy, one of the most brilliant Roman leaders, politicians, generals that there ever was for Rome. Now, he is going to play a very tumultuous or a very risky game in politics. He's going to rise to power as part of a triumvirate, which is basically an alliance of three powerful individuals for running the Republic, for running Rome. But he is going to overshadow the other two, Pompey and Crassus. Now, Caesar, he also would launch a number of military campaigns to advance his political career. Um, he's going to win the favor of the lower classes, the people, the common people. They love, they love Julius Caesar. And he's going to be gaining a lot of suspicion from the senators. They're starting to become very, very uh, 
they don't trust him a lot. They think that he is going to want to try and make himself a king, basically. Now, with this triumvirate, we're going to see kind of a civil war breakout between Caesar and Pompey. And he's going to capture Italy and drive Pompey out, like out of the country completely. And he is going to make himself in the year 45 BC, uh, dictator for life. He ends the cycle of dictators giving up their power after a crisis is done. He wants to stay in charge. Now he's going to put a bunch of reforms to strengthen his power in place at, at the expense of the patricians, the other nobil nobility, the other rich people. Uh, his most lasting reform is actually a calendar, the Julian calendar, which is based off of work in Alexandria by scholars, which is, was used in the Western Europe until, you know, maybe 200 years ago, 150 years ago, something like that. Uh, believing that Caesar would become a tyrant and was being a tyrant, he is going to be assassinated by a group of senators and he gets stabbed to death on the Ides of March, you know, the middle of March, March 15th, 44 BC. Now, that is immortalized in R William Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar. And you know, I highly recommend watching like anything dealing with Julius Caesar because he lived an incredible life. All right. Now, the end of the Republic. That is going to be when a second triumvirate is formed after Caesar's assassination and uh, these, these guys who are in charge, Octavian, which is Augustus Caesar, he's the guy who's, you know, the Roman emperor, basically during the time of Jesus, uh, like when he's born. Um, he's also Julius Caesar's, like, adopted son, nephew kind of person. Um, but he and this guy, Mark Antony, who is uh, pretty important in Roman history, he is... He's a guy who marries uh, Cleopatra, the queen of Egypt. Uh, then there's Marcus Lepidus. Uh, he's not really too important. He kind of just falls by the wayside. The big two are Octavian and Mark Antony. They're actually going to go to war against each other also. And that is when the Second Triumvirate falls apart, is like the civil war that breaks out between them. And Octavian is going to win the civil war. He's going to be the undisputed ruler of Rome and becomes eventually the first emperor of Rome. All right, so that is where we're going to leave off talking about the government and the expansion and crisis of the Roman Republic. All right, so when we come back next time, we'll be getting into the actual Roman Empire. So don't miss out on that, guys. I will talk to you later.